Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to seminar nine in the Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan Review Seminar Series. Um, my name is Maria Rosier, and I'm managing the review the review process. And we're doing these seminars to help share information that's really important and relevant to the review. And if you remember in seminar one, if you were there. Um, we spoke about the different bits of the puzzle that come together to inform the next version of the plan. And a really foundational scientific piece is the scientific consensus statement. So we are super privileged to have Jane Waterhouse today with us to give us um, an overview on the process and the results of the scientific st uh, consensus statement, um, which will really help inform the next version of the plan. So very excited. Thank you so much, Jane, for coming. Um, before I kick off to Jane, I will um, just do an acknowledgement of country. I'd, li I'm, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands where we are all meeting today. For me, it's the Yagara and Turbo people. I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the reef traditional owners and really acknowledge the the depth of knowledge, science, and duty to care for um, country and that very special connection between healthy country and healthy people and that holistic uh, worldview. Um, today is also the World Indigenous Days of uh, the World Day for Indigenous Peoples, so I thought I'd share um, a statement from the Director General of UNESCO. Um, she asked us for on this day, let us remember that indigenous people are actors of change, guardians of natural resources and carriers of unique worldviews, knowledge and skills. We must protect their traditional and ways of life, their traditions and ways of life while respecting their rights. Um, and I think we've spoken about how acknowledging traditional owner rights is a really important part and scope of our review. Um, if you're Indigenous and you're on the line, I'd also like to pay my respects to your elders past and present and your story. So with that, I will pass on to Jane and I will see you on the questions and answers time. Great, thanks Maria. Uh, good morning, oh, good afternoon everybody. I'm Jane Waterhouse from C2O Consulting. Um, today I'm going to give you an overview of the latest scientific consensus statement and I'm representing a large number of people. There are over 200 experts involved, but particularly wanted to acknowledge others in our team. So Katie Sandbrook and also Murray Carmen Panita, um, as well as others in our team that have helped contribute to deliver this project along with everybody else that's been involved. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview, bigger picture about the consensus statement what it is, and then a bit about the process. I'll present some of the conclusions in a little bit more detail before just highlighting to you some of the key resources that are available for um, accessing the information. So hopefully most of you are familiar with the consensus statement. It brings together the peer-reviewed and published scientific evidence about how land-based activities influence the Great Barrier Reef and its ecosystems and how these can be managed. So these have been um, generated since 2003 and supported the initiation of the very first reef water quality improvement plan. And they're done approximately every five years. So this is our fifth one. Um, so it's 20 years since we did the first one. It's really interesting to look across that evidence base, what's been strengthened, what's changed, what's now emerging. So it typically includes evidence from 1990 through to the end of uh, 2022. Uh, which is largely um, to, we completed the uh, evidence searches and whatnot through to the end of 2022. Uh, so it won't include the very latest information over the last year and a half or so, um, but it, prevents, uh, it presents the evidence and it doesn't make recommendations, which is really important. So this science has been pulled together um, in a very systematic way, and now it's essentially available to be used in another number of applications, including, of course, the Water Quality Improvement Plan. So just highlighting that point again, really, this is, um, I guess, the primary scientific evidence base for the update of that plan. 
but there's a lot of other information that you've heard about through this seminar series that also feed into that. So, for example, the review of the targets, water quality ones, as well as management practice adoption, for example, plus others. There's also a spatial management prioritisation that where our team's also involved in. But of course, the engagement with other audiences and other knowledge is absolutely critical. So this is very much about the published evidence and there's a huge range of information that is used to develop policy for the Great Barrier Reef. Just in terms of the scope, so what is the, how much um, and what does the scientific consensus statement cover? So it's the whole Great Barrier Reef um, and its ecosystems, but it's essentially really critical to highlight that we are including the catchment to the reef, um, important connections. And so it's the 35 basins adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. There is this question specifically that addresses the connections between the catchment and the reef, and it just highlights how essential that is, not only for, um, I guess, those ecological components, but as Maria said, uh, the evidence around those cultural connections as well. And we consider in the scope a wide range of ecosystems. So the marine ecosystems, including coral seagrass, pelagic, benthic and plankton communities, estuarine ecosystems, and then also freshwater. So the wetlands and floodplain wetlands specifically. So it's not just about the reef. Um, we do pick up wetlands in this. And we have in previous ones before, but there um, it's expanded this time round. In terms of which land uses, so it's the ones that we, uh, the major land uses in the Great Barrier Reef that are reported and considered in the Paddock to Reef program largely. So grazing, sugarcane, irrigated and dry land cropping, horticulture, bananas, urban and other. So that's things like conservation and forestry. And you can see the breakdown here um, where grazing is very much the largest um, land use in the Great Barrier Reef catchment area and the others can combined to uh, make up the rest in relatively small proportion for some of them, which becomes important as I'm talking about some of the other information. In terms of the primary pollutants, so we've looked at nutrients, both particulate and dissolved, sediments, um, pesticides and other pollutants, which um, is a whole range of different pollutants that make up the rest essentially, including things like metals and plastics and coal dust and pharmaceutical products. That just gives you an indication of um, the scope of what we're looking at in terms of the process. So as I said, we've been doing this for several iterations and each time I would say the processes uh, have continuously improved in, in the way that they've pulled the information together. So this time round, a survey was undertaken by OGBR after the last consensus statement about what needed to be different, what worked, and how people would like to see the information available to them. And some of the features that they identified have um, were absolutely important in going forward in, in doing the review for this iteration. One of them absolutely was around independence. So our team, um, C2O Consulting, was engaged independently for the design, development, delivery of the consensus statement, bringing everyone else together to contribute to that. Um, so we were independent of government. We have developed fit for purpose um, methods for the peer review, the evidence synthesis, as well as the consensus process based on um, best practice standards. And we've had input to that to ensure that we do pick up that the best practice outputs. Uh, for the first time, and it's been um, we've had oversight and assurance provided by Australia's chief scientist, Dr. Kathy Foley, which has been uh, really important, and I'll have a slide on that in a second. And I guess a lot of the features that we've added in are really about building trust in the science. So that came up last time, and it sort of led to a whole lot of discussion around the process about how do we build confidence and trust in the material that we're pulling together uh, to ensure that we're producing high quality science that people will use and feel confident using. Um, part of that was also engaging stakeholders in the process, so they had input to the question setting and then they've been informed throughout. And to support all of that, we've had a set of guiding principles uh, which were identified as part of our development of the methods, but also picked up by Dr Foley specifically saying, here's the things that you probably need to be able to deliver against and demonstrate that you have delivered against them. So they are about minimising bias, having that independence of government, ensuring that it's fit for purpose. For the first time, assessing confidence in the evidence so we know where we're 
things are, we've got good confidence where there's things that are emerging or where there might be some uncertainty or debate still. Ensuring the processes are transparent and well documented and having that engagement element throughout, as well as ensuring that things are accessible at the end. Um, so a lot of people have been involved in that, <laughs> ensuring that we've addressed those principles throughout the process. So I should have mentioned we started in October 2021 um, and we've just uh, come to the point where we released it last week. In terms of the oversight and overview, that's been quite um, substantial change from the previous iteration. So we have had very formal arrangements. Um, a lot of the people were still involved, but they've had uh, formalised roles uh, more so than before. Um, in particular, the Reef Waterfall Independent Science Panel provided a lot of technical review and advice. Um, we've had uh, engaged an evidence synthesis expert specifically to assist in the development of the methods. We had advice from the independent expert panel. We had an editorial board for the peer review, which I'll talk about, and a number of working groups. And of course, we had the oversight by uh, Dr Foley as Australia's chief scientist. In terms of Dr Foley's role, she um, provided input to each of the major processes, which I'll talk to in a second, but um, I guess she has ge generated a final report of an assurance statement of the processes used to develop it. So she wasn't involved in um, the actual content, but more the processes to develop it. So I've just included a quote here on this slide um, where she identifies that the scientific consensus statement is an exemplar of the academic methods for reaching scientific consensus. And I think really very reassuring, she says the public can trust the processes used to develop the 2022 scientific consensus statement and the conclusions can be relied upon and trusted to inform decision making. So Dr Foley's report is available. Um, it's provided in the link at the end of this slide. And she really based that based, um, based that conclusion on the documentation of each of the major steps that we've used in the process. So these are separate approach documents. So each one of these major steps has been written up and then she reviewed that. Um, she was also involved in a lot of these processes in terms of being kept up to date. So the question setting process, that's where um, we developed 30 questions in consultation with policy as well as some um, stakeholders to prioritise those. Um, for what is the breadth of the evidence that we need to be considering? What are the questions that we need answered? Um, part of which is for updating the REAP 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan. We had a very strict author selection process with an expression of interest with three rounds. We went to over 500 experts, um, both in Australia and internationally. We had the um, formal methods developed. As I mentioned, we engaged Rob Richards from Ambidentry to assist with that. We had a very formal peer review process, which I'll talk to in a sec. Then we had, um, they were engaged to look at the actual synthesis of evidence. And then we had separate reviewers for our summary and conclusions, which were derived through a formal consensus process. So I'm gonna talk, take you through a little bit each of those, but just to um, give you an indication of what the outputs are. So the greatest detail is in the actual, the evidence base. So the 30 questions, which are across eight themes. Um, and we've used the each question addressed um, the each question pulled together the synthesis in a very structured way, um, and they all generated a high level summary, which we've called an evidence statement, and that was fed into the summary process. So that was where the consensus process started for a more detailed summary that then informed into the conclusions document, which I'll talk to in a sec. In terms of our um, themes that I mentioned. So one and two were sort of grouped together. They're really the background. So what's the current status and um, extent of ecosystems in the Great Barrier Reef? And then the, I guess, the context of water quality um, with other threats such as climate change. So there's specific questions around that. Then we go into the themes around the actual pollutants. So for sediment, particulate nutrients, dissolved nutrients, pesticides and other pollutants. And for each of those, we consider where are they? in those ecosystems, what do we understand about their impacts, where do they come from, how do they get there, and then the management options for those in terms of the actual water quality effectiveness and cost effectiveness as well. And then there's the human dimensions aspects, which is about the programs and the people, um, things around adoption, 
and there's also a question on Indigenous involvement. And then finally, future directions in emerging science, which had a couple of questions, one around monitoring evaluation and one around co-benefits. So I'm going to step, take you quickly through each of those major steps um, in the development process. So pulling the evidence together, we um, developed a specific method based on um, rapid review methods. So it's very consistent and standardised. So when you go to each question, you'll see they followed a very um, uh, the same template and the same method for pulling together the evidence searches as well as the actual synthesis itself. So it is transferable. You could read, do a new question um, yeah, as needed, and also it's very it's repeatable. So in theory, um, the outputs would be the conclusions drawn would be the similar based on the steps that have been taken. Um, the, as I mentioned before, and important to highlight is that it's all based on publicly available peer reviewed material only. The steps that we've taken have been designed specifically to minimise author bias. Um, and we've also done each question did an evidence appraisal related to the relevance. So in terms of spatially and temporally across the Great Barrier Reef, so looking at studies and the whole evidence base, how relevant are they to the Great Barrier Reef? Are they transferable or is there really only one study that sort of covers off on this in one location? So those sorts of things are highlighted. And for the first time, we assess the confidence in the evidence, which is based on the consistency of the findings across the studies, as well as that relevance. Um, I guess that so when I'm talking about confidence, the sorts of things that would lead to high confidence are where we've got multiple lines of evidence. Um, so where, that's where you've got similar findings from a range of study types. So, for example, monitoring, modelling, different observations that give us confidence in the findings. And an example of that would be, for example, our sediment story. We've got um, coral coring, we've got tracing, we've got the monitoring and modelling information, and then we've got satellite imagery as well. So there's key findings where we do get the evidence lining up that gives us high confidence. In terms of the peer review process, as I said, we had an independent editorial board that had an editor in chief and six editors um, with a range of expertise relevant to our evidence base. Um, this was pushed very strongly by Dr. Foley as a requirement for the process. So uh, the board together, each was allocated um, a lead and a second editor. Each question was allocated a lead and second editor. We ended up with 63 reviewers for the 30 questions. So most of them had two, one international, one with GBR, sorry, international or national, and one with GBR relevant experience. And there was a few questions where we had um, three reviewers and that's where the information, I guess, was considered to be a bit more uh, debated. And also um, if the project leaders were involved in uh, current work that might be seen as a conflict of interest. In terms of the approach, we used a method very similar to what they use in index scientific journals, only more. Uh, so there, each review was required to fill in a very structured template um, that was related to our method um, and had questions around the things that we were trying to achieve, like minimising bias, ensuring that that rigour and quality was there in the evidence and that they had correctly interpreted the evidence base to come up with their conclusions. In terms of the review of the final product, so the conclusions and summary were reviewed separately by external peer reviewers. So we had three um, reviewers that were selected by Australia's chief scientists, so Dr Foley, as well as the editor-in-chief, who was Russell Reichelt, and they had expertise in relation to agricultural, marine and catchment areas. So very comprehensive process for peer review. Our consensus process uh, had two major steps. So the summary document, which was derived from those evidence statements that I mentioned for each question, that included 35 experts, so all of the leaders plus some additional, additional contributors um, from each of the themes. And the way we did that, then we used a single draft text procedure. So what that means is our team created a draft of the summary statements, and then that was circulated to those small groups of experts who had three rounds in an iterative process to comment on and then reach agreement on the final wording. The conclusions then were derived based on, I guess, those outputs saying to the teams, what are the most important things that we really need to communicate at the highest level uh, for each of those themes? And we ran a workshop with them that was facilitated by an independent person to pull together those final conclusions. And then they reached agreement 
uh, we had a couple of iterations by email before we then had a poll where we got everybody to agree to the final wording. And that's the group there that was involved in that workshop was the only workshop we had, which was fantastic. In terms of here's some of our headline numbers. So um, we had, as I mentioned, lots of stakeholders had the opportunity to contribute to the question setting. We had a process early on where we invited submission of literature for consideration. So altogether, 20, 229 items for tw from 28 people. We had authors and contributors, a total of 78 of those. We had a couple of expert working groups. Um, we had a lot of groups that we consulted with in terms of advisory groups in the water quality space, our editorial board, the peer reviewers, and, and then of course our team and Dr Foley. When we're talking about the evidence base, so one of the things that we did in the previous consensus statement, so QUT and Taste Stewart particularly, um, did a bibliometrics analysis. So when we pull together all of the references, we can have a look at some of the characteristics of that evidence base. So this time, 4,040 publications were used, um, including 440 that were used by more than one um, question. And you can see there the significant difference there is more than doubled from what we used in 2017. And then in terms of the number of authors that were cited, so that's uh, across all of those studies that were included in the evidence space, there was just over 9,000 authors um, that were cited, which is almost triple what was included in the 2017 statement. And this is a result of those very structured searches um, that were required in the uh, literature searches as part of that method that I mentioned. So just in terms of, um, I can move on to the conclusions now. So there's eight major conclusions. And as I said, they are the points that came up um, several times across the evidence space and needed to be highlighted um, from the experts' um, view and the consensus that we'd reached in the concluding statements and also the summary document. So I guess in saying these, they are quite high level, but it's really important that we recognise that there is a lot of variability across the Great Barrier Reef that's massive, and there's variability in the way that people do things and the way that management actions can work. So um, these are our high level and we constantly encourage people to go beyond the conclusions when they're considering the findings of this statement. So the first one is really around um, recognising the major changes that in the catchment that have led to changes of water quality in the Great Barrier Reef and its ecosystems. So it's, it's things like catchment modification through extensive vegetation clearing or degradation changed hydrology, increased erosion and expansion of those fertilised land uses, urban centres and coastal developments. So the second one is then looking at what does that mean? So what's happened as a result of that? So there's been um, considerable increases in pollutant loads. So here presenting the um, those estimates of the pre-development load increases or increases since pre-development time, I should say, of 1.4 to 5 times for fine sediments and 1.5 to 3 times for dissolved in organic nitrogen. And that ranges because it depends on the basins and where you are. Um, and these are uh, quite, um, these are well supported by multiple lines of evidence. So monitoring modelling, as I mentioned, in some cases, tracing, coral cores, other pieces of information. So the third one really about then what does that mean? So um, poor quartz. Cool, we, are, we do know that poor water quality um, continues to have impacts on Great Barrier Reef ecosystems um, in terms of fine sediments, nutrients and pesticides. And we also know, and important to reiterate, that the greatest impacts are on the freshwater estuarine and coastal and short marine ecosystem. So while a lot of the, um, the reef is different in terms of its distance from the coast, so in the northern Great Barrier Reef it's much closer, down as you get further to the southern Great Barrier Reef that's further offshore. So in those um, northern sections, sometimes in those flood plume periods, you will get that, uh, that land-based runoff influencing the mid-shelf zones, um, but it's less frequent. So this is like generally uh, the greatest impacts are in those inshore marine ecosystems. And that's where a lot of our key ecosystems like seagrass and the species that depend on them are. The fourth one is really about water quality in the context of other threats. So human-induced uh, human climate change is absolutely the primary threat to the Great Barrier Reef. 
um, and poor water quality can make those influences worse. Uh, so that's just highlighting that good water quality is critical um, for maintaining healthy systems and it also supports recovery from disturbances like those mass bleaching events or extreme weather events like the floods or cyclones. Um, and from that, then, there is a range of evidence that indicates that meeting the water quality improvement targets within the next 10 years is absolutely imper imperative if those things continue to interact together. The fifth one is really around land management. Um, so um, identifying that there are uh, there is good evidence around some practices in terms of their water quality benefits as well as cost effectiveness. Um, but also recognising that if we're going to really let, get on with substantial pollutant reductions, it's going to require significant scaling up of the adoption of these actions that we're confident in, the prioritisation of the hotspots, where, in knowing where they're coming from, and then greater knowledge of the costs and potential co-benefits. So what are the other things that we could um, benefit from these water quality practices? So, for example, in terms of economics outcomes, biodiversity, um, soil carbon are uh, the factors that become increasingly important. The fifth one is really about locally effective management solutions um, and recognising the value of them. So I talked about the scale of the Great Barrier Reef and there is a really need to focus down into the smaller scales given that variability across the reef and the variability between communities and land uses and how those things work together. Um, so they we know that doing that, and there is evidence that doing that leads to faster adoption of those practices, especially when they're designed in a collaborative way, involving a range of um, parties, including landholders, Indigenous communities, the broader community policymakers and scientists, so pretty much everyone. The seventh one is about the monitoring program. So the evidence recognises the um, value of the Great Barrier Reef monitoring and modelling programs that are already in place, including the Paddock to Reef program, and that they're absolutely essential for their continuation. A lot of the evidence included in the scientific consensus statement comes from the Paddock to Reef program, for example. Um, but it does recognise that they could be strengthened and refined by increasing their spatial and temporal coverage to capture regional, regional and local differences. And there are areas that come up all the time where there are gaps in the evidence. Um, but also having more coverage across land uses and ecosystems. So typically the information is often related to sugarcane and grazing, for example, when we're talking about major land uses. Um, and in terms of ecosystems, there's some gaps. Uh, there's not as much around wetlands, for example. And we've got some long-term data sets now. So being able to do some trend analysis and enabling us to, quanti to quantify the uncertainties will certainly help inform management going forward. And the final one is around research effort and more consistent methods across a number of things. So these came up consistently across a lot of the questions um, and the evidence base. So the first one is around the co-benefits and the efficiency, so water quality benefits as well as costs of management solutions across different landscapes and climate conditions. So some of that information exists, but it's not necessarily consistent, so it's difficult to compare. Um, the second one is around the effectiveness of water quality improvement flow programs and instruments, so including the assessment beyond the life of programs, so some of that is not available in the published literature, and then ecosystem risks from a wider range of pollutants. Um, so that would be things like other pollutants in, such as metals, plastics, whatnot. Okay, when I talk about um, the confidence, we when we're looking at the level of conclusions, they we haven't put a confidence rating on those, um, but we do talk in the conclusions document about the strength of evidence. And in that, we've taken into account the confidence that I mentioned, so consistency and relevance of the studies. Also the quantity, so where we've got a, a large evidence base and the diversity, so that multiple lines of evidence concept that I mentioned. Um, so, They've been grouped into high, moderate, limited to moderate and lowest. And this sort of gives you a bigger picture. What is the stuff that we know really well, we're confident in, we've probably been saying it, some of it since the very first consensus statement. So that's around the value and the connectivity of Great Barrier Reef ecosystem. So the connections between the catchment and the reef and how they're how important they are. Uh, the spatial and temporary distribution of sediments, nutrients and pesticides. So where do they come from? Where do they go? 
Um, and then some of the it, the impacts on some GVR ecosystems is quite well established as well, um, with some exceptions around wetlands and other plants that I already mentioned. In terms of the moderate strength of evidence, that's where the a lot of the effectiveness of management practices information sits. So, for example, there's limited information on certain land uses, um, like bananas, horticulture, urban and roads. Um, but there are, when I say this, is I'm generalising to an extent because there are some management practices that are quite well established, which you would you will see when you go into the evidence space. Um, and there's some gaps in the around certain management practices in the context of the Great Barrier Reef. So a good example of that is stream bank rehabilitation, where there's um, no formal published evidence around the water quality effectiveness of stream bank works in the Great Barrier Reef. There is work nationally and internationally that we can draw on. Um, and similarly for wetland systems, there's few studies, but that evidence base is absolutely growing. Um, so emphasising the need for some further studies in those spaces, for example. The li limited to moderate is where the effectiveness of programs and instruments sits in relation to um, improving management practice adoption and then the factors that influence that. So highlighting there too that um, a lot of that information doesn't sit in the published peer review literature. So not to say it's not out there, it's just not in the evidence space that we've had a look there. Um, but there are, I guess, some limitations in that, as I mentioned before, around consistency and the ability to compare across programs. And the lowest one is other pollutants. Um, so there's very few studies on that in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, there is a bit more on metals, for example, uh, but the other types of pollutants, there's hardly anything, and especially in relation to ecological risk. And then the final one is around, um, as I mentioned, we had a question around the factors of success and in Indigenous involvement in water quality management and decision making. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of that evidence doesn't sit in the peer reviewed literature, um, but that question did look internationally and it identified some really important principles that are, um, I guess, reinforced in with our understanding here. But of course, if you wanted to know about that, you'd go and talk to traditional owners and uh, their experiences. So this would complement that, um, that policy sort of at the very beginning when we define that question took on to recognise that the scientific consensus statement was only one tiny part of that puzzle. In terms of recent findings, I'm, I'm just going to skip over this quite quickly because it's in the um, actual conclusions document, but then we have grouped them into areas where we've reinforced our knowledge, we've got new knowledge, um, particularly in relation to human dimensions. There's a lot of new stuff around the um, social aspects of people uh, being involved in management and the increasing importance of recognising that. Um, there's some new knowledge, so probably doesn't seem new to a lot of you, but think about since the last consensus statement, that whole piece of work around large-scale gully remediation is new. Um, and then there's some emerging research. So, for example, in relation to the wetland treatment systems. The conclusions document also identifies knowledge gaps. So um, they're at the highest level and they, uh, I won't go through them now. Some of them were there before and probably the iteration before that as well, um, but they cover off on the full evidence base and they're all in the context of a changing climate. So our knowledge of what are the likely impacts of climate change on all of these factors um, is still quite limited in a lot of these spaces. Um, I'm just going to go quickly now through some of the theme findings and I'm mindful of the time and the need to leave time for questions. Um, I might actually skip over some of these, but I just wanted to give you an indication um, that this is from the conclusions document that is uh, quite easy to read and it's intended to be like that, it is high level. Um, and it covers off on each of the themes. So it's pretty cool. And we keep saying that, it's, that any decisions or any, when you're looking across the evidence base, need to look beyond the conclusions and even the summary into the actual synthesis of evidence. And um, what I'll show here, just for each of the major themes, just wanted to highlight to you um, for them, each of the, what the um, major questions are. Um, just a very quick snapshot what their level of confidence is. So you can see in this theme, theme in relation to values, we're looking very much at a high confidence level across most of these questions. 
Um, and I'm just going to skip through that because I really want to get to the point where I can show you some of the resources. So these, um, and this will help you to go through when you look at the conclusions, uh, what are some of the, this is the headline statement that each expert group came up with. So we said to them, what are the, well, they weren't allowed more than a few sentences, what are the main messages that we need to put across for these themes? Um, so uh, I'll leave them with you to have a look for the sediments and particulate nutrients. They, the group used around 850 studies. Uh, there were six questions and that evidence base is sitting at sort of a moderate to high. And you can see for each pollutant, we've got um, where the pollutants go, what are the impacts, the sources and distribution in terms of what are the drivers to those and then the management options. So you'll see that's followed for each of the pollutants. Um, and I'm not going to go through these because I'm want you to go and have a look at them. Um, for dissolved nutrients, 1,272 studies used. This is our biggest theme, so there are actually um, nine questions for this one. And similar to the sediment in terms of the types of questions, we added one around the drivers of crown of thorn starfish outbreaks and the role of water quality in that. And we've also got three specifically around wetlands in terms of their efficiency in water quality improvement. Um, the costs of that and then ecosystem services. The pesticides and other pollutants has four questions. Um, they range, so the other pollutants are, as I mentioned, the ones where we've got the sort of lower confidence overall, um, but same thing. So spatial and temperature distribution and the impacts and risk, where are they coming from? And then the effective um, management practices. And the final theme around human dimensions emerging science are 650 studies. Um, as I mentioned already, and I've explained, these are sort of where we've got our lowest confidence, partly because some of it's emerging and some of it you just would not find necessarily in the peer review published evidence. So this, I just wanted to step you through some of the resources um, where you can go to explore further what I've just sort of given you a very high level snapshot of. So the website has, was launched on the 1st of August, so last Thursday. Um, I think Emma's going to put those links in the chat. Uh, hopefully some of you have already had a chance to look at it. Uh, but this is the main grid on the landing, landing page, so there's a lot of information there, but um, you can navigate your way through to the actual conclusions, uh, the summary documents, the evidence, which is the 30 questions, the themes, which summarises the information from the summary document um, for each theme and leads you to the questions that support that. A uh, number of topic summaries, which I'll mention shortly, um, the cross-cutting themes, which covers groups things, so you can navigate questions a little bit more easily. The whole process, so every step of the process is described. The FAQ, so we've got some frequently asked questions and a glossary that explains some of the terms that are used. Just so you can see what's in those theme summaries from the summary document. So there's the summary statement for each theme. It gives a bit of context. There's a very neat conceptual diagram for each of the themes as well, um, as well as all of the evidence statements. But it summarises the key parts of that evidence appraisal that I mentioned. So it describes the number of items, the diversity of the items, so the study types that were covered in the evidence base the overall relevance and the consistency. It gives you a better idea of how we arrived at the confidence at a summary um, for the theme levels. The evidence base, so that's all of the 30 questions and they're grouped into um, themes and you can also navigate to them from the theme. So each question has its own little icon and box that you can click on and you can download um, the actual synthesis of evidence and read the evidence statement. The topic summaries are a way of summarising the information um, in a bit more graphical format. So there are two pages for each of the major land uses and ecosystems. Here's an example here for sugarcane. So we talk about, um, in terms of the sources, uh, what are the pollutants that we know are linked to different land uses, what are the sources of those? And then on the back page, you've got a little bit more about the management options and understanding of ecosystem impacts related to each of those. And the process document, so that's, um, as I said, we've documented everything. So this takes you through all of those um, components in terms of the approach that we've used and a little bit more detail about um, 
how we got there. You can also find information about the previous scientific consensus statements. They're all downloadable from that uh, final bottom right page as well. And the FAQs, so these were 34 questions def uh, defined by policy about the findings and the process. So um, they are downloadable as one document, or you can view them on the screen by clicking on them as well. So just to sum up, um, we reiterate again and again, the consensus statement doesn't make recommendations for policy. It's about evidence. It's not opinion. It's not advocacy. It's the evidence base as we currently understand it through to the end of 2022. It is the most comprehensive and rigorous review that we've ever done um, about the land-based influence on um, Great Barrier Reef water quality and its ecosystems and how um, management actions that can support that. Um, we have followed international best practice standards for our methods that we've used. Um, it's very neat, I find, in that it identifies where this evidence is strongest, where it's uncertain and where it's emerging. Um, and we've also got that additional benefit of the standardised methods. So questions could be added. It can be transferred to other settings as well in terms of other environmental management of interest. And just... I will say again and again as well, don't stop at the conclusions and the summary. Uh, we need to look at the full evidence base. We are dealing with a very large ecosystem, so I encourage you to get into the detail because it is variable um, within and across questions in terms of the sorts of things that we cover. Um, and it's a huge resource, so uh, very encouraging to people to look at that. And finally, our acknowledgements. So these are the people that have been involved in the development. It's a huge list. Um, these are acknowledged in the summary document, but yeah, just wanted to thank everybody for their input. That's it. Thank you. I ran over time. There's so much to say. You do so well, Jane. It's amazing. And uh, just I, my brain, you know, it's getting around covering 4,000 papers the number of authors, the number of contributors and getting consensus is a phenomenal effort by you and your team. So um, thank you so much. I think for us policy practitioners, having that level of sound evidence base to, you know, to analyze and develop policies is so very important. So we are very appreciative. Um, and Emma, we'll stop the recording now, please. And we'll jump into questions and answers. So.